Good evening. Welcome. Uh, I'm honored to uh, open the last event of our Ecstatic Poetry Place International Festival, celebrating the International Poetry Day, which uh, was two days ago. My name is uh, Gilad Meiri, and I'm part of the literary committee of the festival with uh, Atara Ben Hanan. Say hi. And Noah Shakarji. Um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Eran Selgo, who is an award-winning uh, poet and uh, translator. Um, a few years ago, uh, he published a, a poetry book with the translations of uh, Chris Sabani. And uh, Eran will uh, host the show and shortly he will introduce uh, Chris. But before that, uh, some technical issues. Your microphone will be muted during the event, but we may dedicate a few minutes at the end uh, to your questions. So you may write them in the chat box. And uh, now I'm uh, very pleased and happy to pass the microphone to you, Iran, and let's have an enjoyable evening. Okay, so uh, Shalom and good evening. I'm super excited. Uh, uh, to see people gather around to hear poetry tonight. I mean, it's uh, like a virtual campfire, but a lot of people are coming and joining this uh, session. So it's, I know, it's a bit hopeful for me. We are on the, it's election day here in Israel. So I'm not too optimistic, but I hope the conversation will make us a bit happier. And maybe we'll see if poetry can help us in dark times and what's the role of poetry. Uh, anyway, uh, Chris is here from uh, Evanston, just uh, near Chicago. And uh, I want to thank him again for this honor and for the privilege to translate his work with my friends. This is the book. And thank you again. Uh, so I will start with uh, introducing Chris a bit. Uh, everybody can uh, Google uh, today and find everything they need, but still some formal points before I forget anything. So, uh, Chris was born in 1966, right? Uh, he is an acclaimed poet, author, essayist, teacher, humanist. He has written, published four novels, two novellas, uh, right? Uh, seven poetry books and one like a long essay, the story of your face, right? Uh, he was born in uh, Nigeria to an Igbo father and an English mother. And since 2001, he lives in the USA. He has a PhD in literature and creative writing from the University of Southern California. His first book a novel was published in his late teen and got him in trouble and imprisoned and after he was released and he continued to write he after a death threat a death sentence he left nigeria for good he is the recipient of many literary awards such as the pen usa freedom to write award the lanan literary fellowship a pen beyond the margins award the pen hemingway book prize and a guggenheim award he is also a loud speaker, though with a soft spoken voice on issues regarding humanitarian issues, right? That's it. And on a more personal level, I met uh, Chris for his poetry and I've translated him even before we met in person. And by a not so simple twist of fate, I met him in Northwestern University when I discovered that his office is just in front of the class I was teaching. So it was a mere coincidence. And I was, oh no, this can't be happening, but it did happen. So it was wonderful for me. So uh, good afternoon, Chris, and let's dive in. Shalom, good, uh, good evening, good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, while trying to summarize your biographies, and there's a lot to summarize here, uh, I got lost in a maze of words. And uh, so to help us a bit, I would like to begin with some poetry, okay? We'll start with geography lesson. Okay. Mm. 
You want me to start? Of course. Okay. <laughs> this I'm is from a book enough. called. <laughs> that was good. This is from a book called Dog Woman, and uh, the poem is called Geography Lesson. Uh, to the Igbo, everyone is family. Everything is connected. Grandmother explained. Like the weave of this raffia mat, we intertwine. See, this is the world to the Igbo. Nodding, the German anthropologist licked her pencil in concentration and wrote, to the Igbo, the world is flat like a mat. Thank you. Shu geografia. Havua Igbo, kolechadu mushpacha. Hakol kshurin zelaze. Kachis bira safta. כמו המקלעת במחצלת הדקלים הזו, אנו שזורים זה בזה. רואה? זהו העולם עבור האיבו. מהנהנת, האנתרופולוגית הגרמניה מלקקת בריכוז את עפרונה ורושמת. עבור האיבו, העולם שטוח כמחצלת. Thank you. It sounds so much better in Hebrew, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so now we'll read another one. <laughs> the new religion, and then we'll start talking about it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> uh, the new religion is from a book called Hands Washing Water. The new religion. The body is a nation I have not known. The pure joy of air the moment between leaping from a cliff into the wall of blue below, like that. Or to feel the rub of tired lungs against skin-covered bone, like a hand against the rough of bark, like that. The body is a savage, I said. For years I said that, the body is a savage. As if this safety of the mind were virtue, not cowardice. For years I have snubbed the dark rub of it, said, I am better, Lord, I am better. But sometimes, in an unguarded moment of sun, I remember the cow dung scent of my childhood skin, thick with dirt and sweat and the screaming grass. But this distance I keep is not divine. For what was Christ, if not God's desire to smell his own armpit? And when I see him, I know he will smile, fingers glued to his nose and say, next time I will send you down as a dog to taste this pure hunger. Thank you. Hadat ha-chadasha. Ha-guf u-uma sh-terem yadati. Ha-osher amti ba-avir. הרגע שבין הזינוק מצוק אל הקיר הכחול שמתחת. בדיוק כך. או לחוש את חיכוך הריאות העייפות בעצם עטויית אור כיד על קליפת עץ קשה. בדיוק כך. הגוף הוא פרא, אמרתי. כבר שנים שאני אומר, הגוף הוא פרא. כאילו שלוות הנפש היא מעלה ולא פחדנות. כבר שנים אני מזלזל בקושי אפל זה, ואומרי, אני טוב יותר, אלי, אני טוב יותר. אך לפעמים, ברגע חשוף לשמש, אני נזכר בניחוח גללי הפרות של אור ילדותי, המכוסה טינופת וזיעה, והעשב הזועק. אבל ריחוק זה שאני שומר אינו נשגב, כי מה הוא הצלוב, אם לא תשוקת האל, להריח את בית שחיו שלו? וכשאראה אותו אני יודע שיחייך, ובאצבעות תחובות באפו יאמר לי, בפעם הבאה אשלח אותך למטה כחלב לטעום את טעמו של רעב מוחלט זה. Some people giggle. You know, it, it's, it's a funny poem, it's funny in two ways. Because first of all, it shows you the, obviously, the Western gaze at non-Western cultures, the translation process, and how we flatten this wholesome notion of humanity into some stereotype of what are non-Western cultures. 
and it makes you when you understand why it's not funny it's it makes you feel funny because it's strange and i know that people move you know in their chairs because they laugh and they understand why they laugh so this is an amazing opportunity to discuss you know what is western culture and all that and the second poem is a very sensual poem a lot of senses are in this poem and as if you try to demarcate or chart your identity through the senses and through the cultures that brought to life the author Isaban. So after I introduced you and after we read poems like that, who are you? How can, uh, what, how can you describe yourself? I mean, how are your birthmarks, so to speak, shape your identity as a human being in the 21st century? I see we're starting off with easy questions. There. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so I think um, the first thing I should say is that I'm always Chris, right? And because for, for a long time, I, I let myself be called Chris Abani. And I came to realize that this was uh, a construction that had did not involve me at all, actually. <laughs> Usually people are negotiating with the work or the public image and their own perception. And so I, I would always end up in situations where I would, um, I would disappoint people. So I figured <laughs> if I, because I'm not, you know, people love to construct you in, in better light than you are sometimes. And so I'm just Chris. And so, so I always operate from, from, from that idea. So I think that the, the several birthmarks, I think being born biracial, right? Um, and sort of I come into language, more two languages very, very immediately. And two languages that are so distinct in the, in the sense, because when you're born into English, you're born into transaction. Right? Because English is entirely a transactional language. It's lost, um, it's lost its metaphoric ability. It's, it's, simply, it's simply how much are your oranges, you know, they're four dollars. <laughs> Whereas in Igbo, Igbo is, is first and foremost a philosophical language. And all negotiations, you don't go to an orange seller and say, oh, how much are your oranges? You start with, wow, these oranges are are beautiful, they're ripe. And then the person has a conversation and you talk about sort of the ritual implication of oranges and then you start to touch the oranges and then you actually say, oh, by the way, are these for sale? It's a constant negotiation. So I think that born in that way sort of as a beautiful thing can happen is that it allow, it brings a certain kind of um, philosophical fluidity into an otherwise stiff communication process. And so it turns English very malleable. So in that way, I guess I straddle two, two, two places simultaneously, a Western place where things are either this or that, and a non-Western place where things are this and that, and the third thing they produce and ad infinitum. So it's a kind of simultaneity that only occasionally comes into a moment. Um, so language is very important in those formations. Uh, landscape uh, is also very important. So, I, um, and you grow up in, in sort of multiple landscapes. You know? um, when you when you see when you're in a plane and you're coming into land in London, you know you, England is very much laid out like a tablecloth, like a patchwork, all these nice little fields. And if you're coming over, if you're coming into West Africa, you're coming into chaos. And there's you know there's something really beautiful about chaos. Um, so again, there's this constant uh, tension between, uh, which makes it great for, for an artist, between control, which is craft in a way, and all the stuff that undergirds that. Um, and, and then to be born into multiple religious contexts, um, to have gone to seminary to be a Catholic priest and to have been kicked out by um, for heresy very young and to, and to then become a traditional priest. So there, there are also then ways in which you are, you are constantly navigating 
sort of what you might think of as narrative realities and objective realities. So I think in a sense, it all, it all sort of comes together in, um, in a person who's always asking questions. You know, I, I, I think that there are different kinds, there are two primary kinds of artists, right? The, the mystic and the saint. And, and to draw on the sort of like the Bible a little bit, <laughs> Moses would be the mystic, right? It's like, yeah. where's the promised land? It's over there. Well, it doesn't look so promising, can we? <laughs> and so then you never quite get there. You die on the side of yeah. a mountain. And then there's Aaron, who's the priest, who kind of thing creates the settled world, so to speak. So I think that that's, that in a sense is who I am, a, a person who's always asking a question, not to find an answer, but to find better questions. So I think that's who Chris is, and I will do it in whatever ways I can. Okay. If I can continue this thought, in a later poem you wrote the following lines. I am not American, though I want to be. I am not Nigerian, even though I have the melancholy. I am something deeper still. For now, Igbo, a placeholder. Ani lo Amerikai, l'amrot sheni rotze lihiyot. Ani lo Nigeri, l'amrot sheesh bi et melancholia. Ani mashu amok od yoter. Bentaim Igbo, memale makom. So, in a way, when you write your poetry, you're always between two poles of your two languages, two religion, two races, and you're, you're this uh, Rafi Amat, also in your poetry. I mean, <laughs> I mean, in a good way. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> when you, one reads your poetry, you can sometimes feel the African culture, the, you know, you, you describe places, you give us names of poets of the Western world. You give names of locations in Africa. And sometimes it almost sounds like a tribal song. And you make it to something, your own new religion or your own way of talking about it that seems so natural as if it's a Poetry is the solution for it all. As we, before we started, you said this is, can go wrong because it's poetry. So is, for you, is poetry a really international language in a way? Can be an international language? Um, these are very dense questions. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I can ask you something. No, 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 it's good. No, I'm not complaining, I, I love them. And return, uh, let's start from the last and, and move backwards. Um, I think that the, the, the truly, so I think as human beings, uh, the, closest, the closest we ever get to each other is sound while we're occupying at least the frontal lobe, right? Mm -hmm. um, sound does things that, you know, language is just codified sound, right? Mm -hmm. um, but sound defeats it. So you don't need to speak a language to know when people are sad or happy or, you can intuit it. The details are almost unimportant. So in a way, sound breaks through the need for uh, detail that can sometimes be a bigger problem than it is in aid. So in that way, of all the written form, I think poetry is the one that comes closest. Um, and, you know, sometimes when I'm teaching class, I will play songs like by Cesare Vora in, in Portuguese uh, with no context. And I ask the kids to translate the songs. And I have the liner notes of the album, and they're always within 60 to 70 percent accurate, even in the choice of words. So it seems that they're, they're, that at, at the core, uh, the things that make us human vibrate largely at, between the oscillations between light and sound. So can it be an in, a truly international language? It can be, but I think sound is even more important in that way. Um, and because I'm a terrible musician, I. I write poetry instead, I suppose. Um, so I think that there is a way in which we, mm. the Igbo say that it is only through story that we come to know people, mm -hmm. or that people come to know themselves. And I think that this is true. And I think that what happens is that uh, and, and in a Western context, uh, 
Chris, you're muted for some reason. Uh, well, you know, that happens a lot. I should say hello to my friends at the NSA and at Mossad. Hi. So, um, <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> um, anyway, so, so I think that what, what it, what it is, is that, um, we are an amalgamation who we say we are is an amalgamation of story and i think that because in the west the most recent moment that people can trace back to a certain kind of conscious definition of self is the renaissance right um and what had led up to that had been so much repression that i think the west is overly intrigued by by the frontal lobe by what we call reason and so in that way <laughs> Uh, other other cultures have much older ways, other older intelligences. Um, for instance, Nibo will say, "Akoke jagano wa manuche ke jamai he, akone be kama uche bungega." The intellect is how we cut our way through the world, but wisdom is a needle, and what is cut must be sewn for it to make sense. Right. <laughs> So there are ways in which even evil thought is not singular. It's the notion that where one thing stands, multiple things stand next to it. So I think that my work is almost a reaction to these, I don't want to call them lies, but these false concepts we hold, passport, nation, these are all constructs of narrative. Um, and in a sense, what the work is trying to say is that human beings are actually uh, what it is to be a human being is to be a ritual that is being enacted all the time, right? So if you grow up Catholic, you're either crucifixion Catholic or you're resurrection Catholic. I was always what fell between those two spaces. So I think that in a way, what, what the most purposeful, useful means of communication is actually misunderstanding because misunderstanding actually is where apertures open if you're brave enough for a real conversation. And so I think that not just, I think every, every human being's identity lies in this liminal space in between, the alleyway, as it were, between two apartment buildings. That's where the truth is. And I think that for different reasons, we choose different apartment buildings. And then, then we start to build all these bastions of defense around it. And then no one, we can't even hear each other over all the filters we have. So I don't know if this even answers the question. You but it was a wonderful, uh, <laughs> it was a wonderful answer, and thank you for the honesty. So, uh, let's read another poem, okay? Uh, histories one. Histories one. Yeah. Just one second. Histories one. Boys are taught to kill early. Five when I shot a chick in my first ritual. Eight when chickens became easy. 10 when I killed a goat. I was made to stare into that goat's eyes before pulling my knife across its throat. Amen. I thought it was to teach me the agony of the kill. Perhaps it was to inure me to blood to think nothing of the jagged resistance of flesh, to make the smell of rust and metal and shit familiar. I have never killed a man, but I know how. I know I can. I know that if the timing were right, I would. I am afraid that I may not feel sorry. I am afraid that I will enjoy it. Okay. Echad. בנים לומדים להרוג מוקדם. בן חמש הייתי כשיריתי בתרנגולת בטקס הראשון שלי. שמונה כשתרנגולות הפכו לקלות מדי. עשר כשהרגתי עז. הם הכריחו אותי להביט אל תוך עיני העז בעודי משסף בסכין עץ עברה. אמן. חשבתי שזה נועד ללמד אותי על ייסורי המוות. אולי זה נועד לחסן אותי למראה דם. לא לחשוב על, על ההתנגדות של הבשר הנקרע ולהפוך את ריח החלודה, המתכת והחרא למוכר. 
מעולם לא הרגתי אדם, אבל אני יודע איך. אני יודע שאני מסוגל. אני יודע שבזמן ובמקום הנכון הייתי עושה זאת. אני מפחד שלא יהיה בי צער. אני מפחד שאהנה. תודה. So before I cry, uh, another poem. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Let's say something about child's play. Something about child's play. So this is from a book um, called Hands Washing Water and sort of comes out of the Sierra Leonean and other kinds of wars. Say something about child's play. The soldier asks the boy, choose which do I cleave, your right arm or your left? The boy, 10, maybe nine, says neither, or when I play, like a bird with a broken wing, I will smudge the line of the hopscotch square, let the darkness in. The soldier asks again, choose which do I cleave, your right leg or left? Older in this moment than his dead father, the boy says neither, or when I dance, the spirit dance, I will stumble, kick sand in the face of light. This boy says, take my right eye. It has seen too much, but leave me the left. I will need it to see God. Thank you. Mashu al mishak yeladim. החייל שואל את הילד, בחר איזו מהן אקטה? את ידך הימנית או השמאלית? הילד, בן עשר או תשע, משיב, אף אחת. אחרת, כשאשחק כמו ציבור שבורת כנף, אמרח את קווי הקלאס ואתן לאפלה להיכנס. החייל שב ושואל, בחר איזו מהן אקטה? את רגלך הימנית או השמאלית. הילד, מבוגר ברגע זה יותר מאביו המת, משיב, אף אחת. אחרת כשארקוד את ריקוד הרוחות, אמעד, ואבעט חול בפניו של האור. הילד משיב, קח את עיני הימנית, היא ראתה יותר מדי. החש ער לי את השמאלית. אזדקק לה כדי לראות את האלוהים. Thank you. Uh, I always choke a little. <laughs> There's a lump in my throat when I read these two poems. It's, I know, uh, I'm a poet myself, you know, but I can never look into the eyes of horror like you do. I know you suffered yourself and not get into that. Uh, but this bravery, the way you look into the terror, I really need you to say something about how, I mean, something that I'll, will allow me to smile again after I read in these poems. <laughs> <laughs> Just say, okay, that's enough. <laughs> <You're>, I mean, <laughs> like, I mean no, no pressure. Um... So, I mean, my, um, so in Nigeria, you know, when we use the word grandfather, grandmother, it can mean, it can mean like a grand uncle, an older member of your family. But I grew up, um, that, so I'm supposed to be the reincarnation of my grand uncle who was a priest, a native priest. And so, but I grew up around, um, Uh, the people who succeeded him and one was was one of my grandfathers and I remember I said to him when I was very young um, in fact I, <laughs> I, had, I had been watching old shows with uh, with a uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard he, he, I think he was Israeli Yuri Geller who used to go around the world bending spoons and so, <laughs> and so I wanted to have I wanted to have psychic abilities to bend spoons and to see spirits And I remember asking him for like whatever medicine to open these eyes. I think I was like maybe 10 or 12. And he said to me, uh, my friend, the problem is not when you see a spirit. The problem is when the spirit sees you and recognizes you've seen it. 
<laughs> and so I think it's that way with with art, right? I think it's that way with art. That, that, that the, the thing about about making art is um, it's never making art that's the problem. It's when art starts to make you. And, and if you're lucky, it will. It will start to reshape you in profound ways. But I, but I, I think I grew, I grew up, so in a, I grew up with multiple levels of privilege. Like I grew up with a lot of material privilege. I grew up with biracial. My father was a very highly placed government official. My mother was a white English woman with some links to, to, to older parts of England. And, and so that was already there, but, but, but we lived amongst very poor people. Uh, we didn't live in cities. We lived often in rural areas because my father was often tasked with with reforming schools in in rural areas. And so, and so I was acutely aware all the time of, of where I stood. I grew up with an incredible amount of intellectual privilege. I was reading by myself at three or four. At five, I used to get paid by my elder brother in cigarettes to do his homework. It was like nine or 10. So I grew up with sort of, a, I grew up, I grew up with a, amount, a tremendous amount of religious privilege, very Catholic, but with this native part of me, but and also like, you know, every Sunday, the, the local Imam who owns Abattoir would bring beef for my dad and we would all end up reading the Quran and getting into arguments. I, my father made sure we'd all read the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. So my house was a house of debate all the time. And so in a way, I think just being aware of all the multiple privileges one carries, but looking around you all the time and being able to register from, from childhood the, the inequity of the world, right? The very, even if the very least you can do is to look at it without looking away and without trying to sentimentalize it because then that, that's just about you making it easy for you. So I don't, I don't even know that it's bravery. I think it's more like it's something that's inevitable. You just, everything I do, all my work, novels, everything is really against forgetting. It's against the idea that, uh, you know, we always want to erase difficulty. And so my work just recuperates all the difficult things, but not not as a catalog of um, despair, but rather sort of to challenge the very notion of transformation, right? So I think that it's easy to think of transformation as a beautiful thing, where it's a very difficult thing. If you've ever engaged on any spiritual practice, everybody thinks it's like, ah, it's not like that. It's always like, stop, stop, stop. So, um, I mean, even the way Rilke describes angels, you, you get the sense of it. And I mean, you know, it's funny because I was talking to a friend about angels the other day and, and they were going on. I said, have you ever actually seen the description of an angel in the Torah or the Old Testament? Like they're not, no one has ever described an angel as a beautiful being with wings and like disembodied eyes and stuff like that. So um, I think what I'm trying to say is that um, every form of human transformation, either through a ritualized form or through a lived form, is a journey through the valley of the grotesque mm -hmm. into a total pit of darkness. And then the sublime comes after that. The most common story that people know whether they believe in the religions or not. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't really believe in religion. And I think it's, it's a nice language for human, human consolations, but um, the journey of Jesus and the crucifixion, this kind of torture, then the torture on the cross, then, then the death and the descent to hell, and then the resurrection, right? So it seems to me that you cannot truly, and then this is, I think, why so much doesn't change in the world, because we want to skip past the difficult and go straight to the sublime. And no, all transformation that is stable and is earned requires you to confront the totality of the experience. So I don't know that I'm brave to do it. I just think that I don't know how else to do it. Okay. So if you can go back to the second poem about uh, the child play. Hmm. In a very clever way, you make the reader ask the final question. You're not asking, you're, le you're making me become the soldier, hmm. asking the question. And this is a nasty trick and an amazing trick. <laughs> no, I mean, it makes me, f I, in a good way, in a, in a good sense of art, obviously, because it makes me feel, you know, I want to save this child. Mm -hmm. And I have the option to close the book, but I have to read. You know, this is the magic of written words. You read on because you, it's, 
it goes word by word to fill in all the story. And all of a sudden, I'm the perpetrator. I am the one that asking a question. It's so I do think it's one way of seeing bravery or even, right. you know, showing the reader uh, the, the horror that lies within us, you know, the readers in every one of us, there's this list, little devil that can one day pop out and become this soldier. That's the problem. Yeah. And you show it wonderfully in this poem. Even in the first poem that it's written in the first person, we say that we might enjoy it. And in the second poem, you make us decide the fate of this little, little boy. Yeah. Well, I, I think you hit on something that's very crucial to my work, which is, so, the, the important, all the work I do implicates me, right? It implicates me because it doesn't suggest I, I know either side of the story. So I think the part of what I do is I suspend the moral order in everything I write. And that's what makes my work particularly hard. It's not actually the details of it, is that there's no escape from it. You, you are simultaneously the soldier and the child. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no reprieve. No one is telling you what is right or what is wrong. Um, in fact, the beautiful language seduces you in such a way that uh, you find yourself trapped in both experiences. But I think that that also comes from growing up both Catholic and, and Igbo in the sense that all ritual that I grew up with is a journey. It's always shaped as a journey. And so everything I write is a journey. And so what happens is I have no judgment against my perpetrators and no judgment against the victims. I, I just present the journey and then I, I, I make the reader go on the same journey and then they have to make the decision themselves. It is a dirty trick, but it's the most effective way, I think, to, be, to retain some kind of objective honesty. Otherwise you end up being telling sentimental stories about the poor. You know, like you said, um, people who are close to me know that I, I, the only thing that makes me cry is when people are good, because I don't, I don't actually think people are good. People have to earn their goodness. And most of us don't even know, we think we're good, but we've never been tested, right? And so I think that that's one of the things I think that the work does is it forces me to test what I'm capable of. And once I can accept that, then I, then I know that maybe I can alter the outcome of certain situations, not for the world, God yeah. no, but just. <laughs> for you. Yeah. So, so we lo live in a state of crisis now in the world, right? The COVID-19 and everything, and life is hard. So I'll ask you the, the most stupid question ever. Why not write something cheerful? Why, what, what is the role of the poet? I mean, you, you start speaking about that. Are, are we prophets, outcasts, renegades? What you are, right. yeah. Well, let me, let me start by saying, I, I, don't, I don't know that, <clears throat> I think other people determine what roles we occupy. Um, I think just just to just to be alive and be able to speak at, at all and to even have anyone hear you is a remarkable thing um, because the world we talk at such cross purposes but I think that so I think that there's something and I think this this pandemic is hopefully taught people that you know human beings always have the moment your house starts to burn down, then you're like, oh my God, fire is a terrible thing. <laughs> but all around you in the village, houses have been burning down all the time. So COVID is not a, is not a, it's not a moment of crisis. It's a moment of crisis that, that affects us all simultaneously. At any point in time, the world is always in crisis. Refugees in Yemen, bombings in Syria, uh, people having a coffee in Tel Aviv and something blows up in their face. Uh, all the time, everywhere in the world, simultaneously, people are always in crisis. Yeah. And, and I think that perhaps one of the most overlooked forms of courage is, <laughs> is just to actually continue to live, just to continue to live uh, as, though, as though 
the crisis is away from you is actually indicative of how how beautiful the human soul can be. So I don't know that this is any, for me, no particularly different time, because if I were to think that, then I'm, then that means every earthquakes have happened in Mexico. Right now, things are happening. 10 people just got shot in the US when they went That's to buy groceries. Yeah. So every day, people are in crisis. And what I, it's easy to forget when it's not you in crisis. And so I think that what is happening now is that we're all in crisis simultaneously. And the even more dangerous part of it is that there's no, although I'm, I hear you all luckily have an amazing, at least uh, vaccination program. So <laughs> you're most you know, not like here. So I think that um, we're stuck. And for the first time, I think there's, for a lot of people, there's no escape from our own internal selves. And to be able to have to confront your own internal self, uh, unmediated, unmediated is uh, actually a terror. Um, I don't know. I think everything I write is cheerful. I don't know. <laughs> it's not. I think the, 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 the something about child's play, I think it's cheerful in that, that you know, the, to think that in this moment, a child has this kind of presence of mind. And to think that the, the, that the idea of play, which is always dangerous, even in our homes, wherever we are with our own children, Play is just simulated violence, right? I mean, that's what fairy tales are. They're ways to sort of reassure us that the demons are outside, you know. But so uh, I don't know that they're not cheerful. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I have a very wicked sense of humor. I, I laugh at all the wrong things. Uh, I think that uh, I think jokes are really powerful. I think just the mech, this is what we we're talking about, geography lesson, that I think that humor is this beautiful thing because the, the, the structure of a joke makes you laugh before you realize what you're laughing at. Yeah. And it's a bit of a suck, but then there's a beauty to that because it forces, it forces simultaneity for you to understand how absurd it is that sometimes we're, we're dealing with these things. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, um, I think, you, can you, can you imagine how amazing it would be right now? You say there's, there's, there's sandstorms going on. And just imagine you were, you were caught outside. You, I don't know, maybe gone camping in, the, in, a, in, a, in a kind of open area. And then you were caught in a sandstorm. And you managed to just make it inside a little tent. And it's crazy all around you. And, and then you managed to get a cup of tea, like a really sweet cup of tea going. And you've got... Each time you take a sip, it's like little pebbles of the grains of sand are in it. But that sugar, that sugar is overriding everything. Right? What could be more cheerful than this? This is how this is how the human race has survived. Otherwise, can you imagine what it would have been like to 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 break a leg five thousand years ago? Like everybody would have just died. So yeah. I'm just saying that I think that I think that we 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 it's the important thing is to always have a sense of simultaneity and also you know as my father my father was a sometimes very evil man he would say hey if things are bad always remind yourself that there are people worse off than you and have a chuckle so <laughs> so yeah. be, be irreverent be irreverent be an animal and i think everything will be fine ultimately it'll be difficult no one will no i'm not pretending not but i think you know i don't yeah, I, did. I don't know. I don't think, you know. Difficult. You wrote some place that uh, I think laughter and crying is the same thing, right? Just uh, the difference is the tears involved. And sometimes not even that, because I've laughed so hard I started crying. So. <laughs> it can depend. I think, yeah, I think it's, just, I think that there's so much that we're working with that is, so pain is one thing. And suffering is a separate thing. And suffering is a story of how you're handling pain. So the more you, the more stories of suffering you can tell yourself, the more, the harder the pain is. And the people who, who acknowledge the pain and tell themselves less stories of suffering, and it's, yeah, you know, so suffering is a story of pain. Pain is real, suffering is optional option. So let's read Courage, because we talked about bravery and courage. Okay, and uh, this is, um, it 
This is uh, from the pilgrimage poem in uh, Sanctificum. Nine, <clears throat> courage is often invisible. Old women who buy their own groceries, mothers who become shadow, women who speak and speak and are not heard until a man says, of course, of course. Children walking through minefields, Palestinians who don't throw stones, wanting only food and life for their children, Palestinians who throw stones, wanting only food and life for their children, Israelis who dare to eat out in cafes, people who feed the homeless, people who don't feed the homeless but love their children well, people who love people, who love animals, young people who will not be fettered, old people who will not die quietly, women who dance with wolves, women who care for the dying, people who speak of rage and abuse, people who suffer pain with a smile, people who suffer pain loudly, people who speak up for their beliefs, children who protect other children, homeless children who smile, people who have to navigate worlds that are designed consciously or not to keep them out, being black anywhere in the 21st century. נשים שמדברות ומדברות, אך אינן נשמעות עד שגבע אומר, כן, כן. ילדים שחולפים בשדות מוקשים, פלסטינים שאינם זורקים ומבנים, שרוצים רק אוכל וחיים עבור ילדיהם, ישראלים בבתי קפה, אנשים שמאכילים חסרי בית, אנשים שאינם מאכילים חסרי בית, אבל אוהבים את ילדיהם, אנשים שאוהבים אנשים, שאוהבים חיות, צעירים שאינם ניתנים לריסון. זקנים שלא ימותו בשקט, נשים שרוקדות עם זאבים, נשים שדואגות לגוססים, אנשים שמדברים על זעם והתעללות, אנשים שסובלים עם חיוך, אנשים שסובלים בקול, אנשים שעומדים מאחורי אמונותיהם, ילדים שמגינים על ילדים, ילדים חסרי בית שמחייכים, אנשים שצריכים לנווט בין עולמות שתוכננו במודע שלא כנגדם, להיות שחור בכל מקום במאה ה-21. So I think <laughs> you actually answered my question before I even started yeah. talking about the notion that you always look, you always see things. And, you're, and this is almost, the way this poem is uh, written, it's almost like a prayer. You know, it's a list of things that you, you recount over and over again, all the, all the suffering in the world. Nothing is better, nothing is uh, worse. And you just, you see it. You never forget to look at it. And thank you for this uh, brave bravery. Yes. But uh, I want to read something more cheerful. <laughs> okay? Something, because, because I, I would discuss a lot of pain and sorrow and so on. That's us, because you know how to write. You always have this, the beautiful is in your poetry. You, you always see it, not only the suffering. So we'll start with a poem, The Unfinished Symphony. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let me, yeah, I, but I do, I do want to say something about this idea of cheerful and not cheerful. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a difference between what is pretty and what is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Pretty things don't last. They're like shiny things, right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful things last because they can, they're earned and they contain both sides, you know? So, I mean, if you've ever been in love, you know, and people you're in love with <laughs> break your heart every minute, and yet you wouldn't stop away, you wouldn't step away from that. Uh, that's, that's, so just, just hold that to it. <laughs> this is from the book, uh, Hands Washing Water, Unfinished Symphony. The light this morning is an area. I turn back to the stirring of coffee, a way to ground this time between the hush and the turning. Outside a hummingbird is spreading rumors among flowers, even now. 
Even after all the wounds have healed, I scratch around a phantom scab, avoiding what lies beneath. When I open the window, rosemary and thyme spill in. Later, I will work loam in the herb garden, crumbling the dirt, whispering dirges, spicing the plants with sharpness. For now, there is Percival's painted fire and the coffee. Sometimes it is enough. Symphonia Biltig Mua. Hao Bebokerzeu Aria. Anishav Livhoshet Akafe. Lech Litron et Arega Haze Ben Ashtaka Le Ben Shigra. Bachutz, Yonek Dvash Mefitz Shmuot Ben Aprachim. Akfilu Akshav. אפילו לאחר שכל הפצעים החלימו, אני מגרד סביב לגלד הפנטום, נמנע מהנמצא תחתיו. כשאני פותח חלון, רוזמרין ותימין גולשים פנימה. מאוחר יותר, העדור בגינת עזבי הטיבול, אפורר את העדית, אלחה שכינות, אטבל את הצמחים בחריפות. לעת עתה יש את האש המצוירת של פרסיבל והקפה. לעיתים? They must speak. And another one. Another this one. Is a, another one. This is a, uh, let me know this too. This is a poem in when I have my own poetry events, I often finish with this one, although it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Because it's a, it's a prayer and uh, it makes me feel good. That's, that's good to know. Well, you know, we, are, we have over the, over the few years become brothers, and so what is mine is yours. So feel free. <laughs> this is also from the, the long poem, Pilgrimage. <clears throat> Pilgrimage, number five. Let me know this, too. The sting of orange zest in my eyes, and chocolate, decadent and truffled, and dancing and milk fresh and bubbling from a goat, and the wind holding me as I free fall from an airplane, and wonder at a goldfish's infinite curiosity, and cats, and dogs, and a child's hand brushing my face, and wings, and still rain, and still rain. <laughs> את צריבת קליפתו של התפוז בעיניי ושוקולד מושחת ומשובח וריקודים וחלב טרי מבעבע מעטינה של עז והרוח הנושאת אותי כשאני נופל ממטוס ופליאה מול סקרנותו האינסופית של דג זהב בחתולים וכלבים ומגע יד קטנה של ילד על פניי וכנפיים והגשם שוב, הגשם שוב. Thank you. Ah, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm too moved to speak right now. <laughs> yeah, thank so, you. So if you can't speak because you're so moved, I can speak for you first. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's, uh, there, are, there are a few interesting questions. Uh, from uh, from the crowd and I just just want to say that uh, uh, Chris that your equal vision is uh, very soothing and uh, very exciting and I want to uh, read uh, Sivar Har Shefi who is a poetess who is uh, asking uh, about the sayings that uh, you just uh, uh, shared with us how how do they um, are they in your poetry? How uh, do you use them? Uh, are they part part of your poetics? Oh, you mean the Igbo the Igbo problems? Yeah, yeah. Um, they 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 they're not just they're not only guiding parts of my poetics. It, it's what that's how it's my spiritual path. Um, you know the. The limits of the intellect are where wisdom begins. And I think all, all human beings seek transcendence. Right? I, think, I think that this is, um, there is a, this is, the, the, you know, 
when people speak of, in religious terms about being made in God's image and or even when they speak about God, these are complicated terms. I, I just like the, the term life. Um, if you were to concrete over the earth, you will notice after a while that moss will start to grow or crack will appear. So I think life has one purpose only, and that is to evolve into, into a higher thing, into a better thing, into a more uh, useful thing. And so I think that the, the intellect's limits uh, survival and, you know, different, you know, technological forms of survival. But if there is a science or a spirituality, then I think it's, it's this higher mind, this thing that seeks to always stitch things together. Um, and so that's really, the, even the whole, of, the structures of a lot of my books, are, but particularly I think in Sanctificum is, is the sort of juxtaposition of the quotidian with what you might think of as a sublime to kind of, there isn't, there isn't really, I mean, in a person's life, a moment when there is something quotidian happening and then a separate moment when there's something sublime happening. I think everything is happening simultaneously and one's ability to, whatever the privilege we have um, that allows us to sort of um, uh, take note of a particular uh, texture of it. Uh, so the sayings, that is this sort of language I grew up in, I think in Igbo before I even think in English. And so, um, so I think it forms an aesthetic, it forms a lot of the basis of the ideas I work with. Um, I think that people who came before us, um, either in linguistic forms or in visual forms, have, re have solved the problem of being human. And it seems like every generation just wants to reinvent the problem. I'm guilty of that too. I, I remember once on a poetry trip to Zimbabwe, um, we were driving all over Southern Africa in a bus with a bunch of poets. And we ended up at a bar in Zimbabwe in the middle of nowhere. And there was this giant rock, um, but it was seemed to be sloping at the front. And, and then the people at the bar said, you should go around the back and you'll be surprised. So we went around the back and it's just full of petroglyphs like, rock paintings, thousands of years old, like five, 10,000 years old, no fencing, no barbed wires, nothing. And I remember stopping, one of my family totems is an elephant. And I remember stopping in front of this blue elephant, breathtaking, a very crude and simple representation, but with blue dye. And to think something 5,000 years old could have been made to look as it was made last week. And next to it was a human hand, just a handprint that had been pressed into white chalk on the, on the wall. And I, and I remember putting my hand on that and, and I immediately started crying. So I think that it's really that, this idea of um, that we all share a very common lineage and everything else we've done is just to complicate ourselves. And so I think what, what languages like Igbo do for me is because it's still so steeped outside of, and it's simply about capitalism, they're steeped outside of capitalist production. Therefore, they still retain this idea of speaking through time in languages that are more embedded in, in sort of capitalism begin to lose that and move into the transactional. So it is a basis of everything for me, not just um, not just that. I hope that answers the question. But I mean, um, I think this was recorded, so you might be able to listen to it again and transcribe those. But you know, there's a, in Yoruba, I have, I'm, I'm finishing a book now, a book of essays called um, um, the, um, the horse language rides in. So the word for proverb in Yoruba is owe, and owe is a shortened form. And so for the Yoruba, uh, the proverb is the horse that language rides upon. So it's sort of these succinct sayings and not aphorisms that are that you could spend a whole book unpacking and so the whole language is littered with them and both both Igbo and Yoruba and you find that it's there are these beautiful ways of having nested conversations because the ability of people to understand a proverb in the context is dependent on age and their culture so parents have free conversations in front of children who never really understand what the conversation is about 
so that's the power of that. It's an it's a it's a, the ability for human beings to have a simultaneously layered conversations that are accessible to everyone and will unfold. It's like code; it will unfold to you as much as you can. Sorry, I ramble a bit. <laughs> A last question from uh, Ori, if you want to say hello, Ori. Hi. Hi. <laughs> she was asking, uh, what uh, made you continue writing, although the circumstances were so difficult? Um, So I, it's, it's very complicated. I think there are multiple reasons for it. I think perhaps the easiest and most succinct one is that I, I, the first thing I ever consciously remember writing, I was six years old and I wrote a story and took it to school and the teacher didn't believe me and I got in trouble. And my, my mother who, who never really believed in interfering in anybody's fights came down to school and rained hell down on everybody. But I think even then I sort of had this notion that this was something. And then at 10, I won, I wrote a story that won a statewide competition for 18 year olds and sort of being, ex, sort of experiencing people's shock and surprise watching this little basketball of a kid roll down the aisle to go pick up this thing. And I realized there was something there. So, and then I published my first novel at 16. So I can't remember a time when I haven't written. And so, I think so much, and then I'm, I'm sort of number four or five, uh, three elder brothers and, and myself and big age gaps. So I was that weird kid who played alone all the time, narrativizing the world. <laughs> so I think that there's never been a time when that hasn't been how I made sense of things. So it's not even really a choice as it's just, it's just, it's just, it's what I do. I don't know how not to do it. Um, uh, but I think that what I struggle with as a, as a writer, and I haven't put out a book in a while, is because I think there's so many books in the world. And so what I, um, what I don't want to do is put out a book that isn't absolutely necessary. So I guess where I am now about writing is less about writing through difficulty, but trying to make sure that if someone only found one poem I'd ever written, that it would be, it would suffice to justify the 55 years I've lived on the planet. Otherwise, I don't see the point of putting it out. There's already so many things people could read and cheerful ones too. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that answers the question. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Iran, uh, please uh, conclude this part in our conclude the festival if you want to say a few words and i just want to yeah so thank you uh, makom and shira all the gang thank you for hosting us and uh, providing the platform to make this event happen and uh, thank you chris obviously for the wonderful 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 words you provide the world and thank you again from all Rav, for the gang in Rav that you allowed us to bring this wonderful work into Hebrew. Uh, I think we had fun tonight, yes, and thank you for that. I, I, I feel good now. Yes, no more fever, and uh, I feel so joyful. Yes. For and, a second. Rem and remember, whatever the outcome is, joy will come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'll yeah. come back to you and see. You know, we are the body of joy. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for these great teachings that uh, they come along so naturally with your poetry. Yeah. And uh, that's a big thing to make this uh, assemblage, to make this connection. And uh, I and we all thank you for this uh, spiritual gift, gifts that uh, you gave us. And um, and I want to thank you, Iran, for. Uh, you know, bringing Chris <laughs> through his poetry and now uh, bringing him himself. Uh, it's, it's grace that we can have you all with us. And uh, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, Poetry Play staff, uh, 
the co-director, Noah Shakarji. Yeah, of course, clap hands, yes. Noah Shakarji, Atara Ben Hanan in the committee, Ayelet Ashachar, Aviv Peter, Shirley Itzhaki, the PR. And I want to thank you uh, being with us uh, during this festival. Thank you to the poets that, uh, and the translators that uh, were here from uh, Sunday till today. And uh, we will meet uh, next year, uh, again, celebrate the first day of spring and uh, three days of the festival. And uh, as we always concluded, thank God. Yes, sure. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.